All righty, everyone. Welcome to another BitGuide session. I'm here with our wonderful guest, Stack Hotler. Stack, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's great to have you. It's great to have you. So I met Stack on Twitter uh, the other day when the markets were tumbling and everyone was panicking. And he put this wonderful, uh, wonderful tweet thread that I was reading to a lot of people on Clubhouse. And a lot of people were resonating to that because there is a lot of truth to it. Uh, so before we start the interview, I just want to read through this thread. And then we're going to go through a few questions together with, with, with Stack. I think Stack has a very, very um, interesting perspective of, of how things can unfold in the near future. And uh, so I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, people on Clubhouse won't be able to see it. But later on, when I uh, share this on, um, on YouTube, everyone will be able to see that. Okay, so this is the thread and it says, we are living through the biggest economic shock of our lifetimes and one of the most pivotal moments in human history. The rules of the game are to stay solvent and secure your Bitcoin in cold storage. So everything is breaking. Years of 0% interest rates encouraged everyone to take on cheap debt. Corporations, countries, individuals, everyone. Most of the debt wasn't used productively, meaning most of it will never be paid off. And now that interest rates are rising, yeah, you can read the rest. <laughs> Our current economic system requires more debt to survive. Just take a look at this graph and you will see that the amount of debt only goes in one direction. And he's sharing the, the, the chart of uh, the debt uh, that is going up in trillions. Um, so if you want to check this out, I'm going to link this later in our uh, YouTube. Uh, so if we don't pile on more debt, the entire thing is going to collapse. And that's what we're flirting with right now, systemic collapse. The amount of new debt required to keep things popped up in at truly silly level is at truly silly levels and the fed is making one last attempt to deny reality by raising interest rates but the only way to stop our momentum is to slam into a brick wall of economic pain which is exactly what's happening we're seeing the chaos play out in all markets Equities are tanking, bond yields are surging, currencies are plummeting versus the US dollar, Bitcoin is selling off, shit coins are evaporating, there are, there are very few places to hide, and cash is being eaten by inflation of 8% and more. Here are some charts that illustrate how crazy things are getting. And here he shares the government bond, the German government bond 10 year yield. Um, that just broke through a four decade long trend line. Um, and the German economy is being crushed by inflation, but the EU can't raise rates without bankrupting Italy and Greece. The EU is obviously trapped. So then he goes on and um, he basically describes the situation in Japan which says the Japanese yen, the third largest currency in the world, is being destroyed by its central bank. The Bank of Japan is buying unlimited quantities of Japanese government bonds to prevent yields from going above 0.25%. Why? Above 0.25% and the Japanese banking system implodes. And then he shares the US dollar versus the yen currency exchange chart. So then he goes on and says, watching the Bank of Japan destroy the yen offers a glimpse into the future of other major fiat currencies, including the United States dollars. When the debt becomes too large, yield curve control and destruction of the currency becomes one of the only ways out. Dollar weakens the dollar weakens versus the Russian ruble. Russia is done accepting cheap fiat for scarce goods. This severely limits 
the ability of central banks to kick the can down the road by printing more currency. Russia is calling the fiat bluff, and the implications are massive. Uh, and then he shows the U.S. dollar versus the ruble, uh, where the U.S. dollar is just crashing against the Russian currency. Um, then he goes on and talks about some of the corp corporate bonds that are selling off. And I'm just going to skip a few of these sections uh, and go to the main part. So here he says, by now you get the point. The entire system is crumbling. Cracks are opening up and portfolios are tumbling to hell. And yet, what can the Fed do? With inflation absolutely crushing people, can they really reverse course and fire up the money printers again? Inflation in the real world means we're now facing an impossible policy choice. Mass default lend, uh, uh, leading to systemic collapse or continuing down the path towards hyperinflation. And this finally brings me to Bitcoin and why I'm calmly stacking through the chaos. Let's be frank. The Bitcoin price is melting down. It's testing the low 20,000 range as Celsius blows up and shit coins head to zero. But the value proposition of Bitcoin remains exactly the same. Everything that is playing out right now is why we've been stacking Bitcoin to begin with. The fiat system is falling apart and we need a form of money that can be held safely outside of the system without counterparty risk. Risk is everywhere right now. And as an investor, you need to decide which risks you want to take on. Let's look at your options. Number one, US dollar, low volatility, but guaranteed loss via inflation, counterparty risk of your bank going insolvent, massive loss if money printer turns on. Second, 60-40 equities plus bonds. This is one of the worst years on record for this allocation, Businesses are facing a recession and governments need to monetize debt. It may be less volatile than Bitcoin, but it's looking like a big loser long term. Third, gold. I actually like gold. Its lack of volatility and ability to self-custody makes it nice to hold when things are melting down. But we've seen that gold barely keeps up with the money printing. And unless the Fed decides to let everything collapse, money printing is ahead. Fourth, individual stocks, energy, commodities. This is popular trade right now. Buy, th buy things that will definitely be needed. It makes sense, but you better be a great trader to do this successfully. Personally, I don't want to have to try to time this notoriously volatile assets. Number five, Bitcoin. Yes, it's getting crushed in the short term, but if you have a strong balance sheet and a long time horizon, that shouldn't impact you. This is an asset that's outside the monetary system like gold, but reacts much more favorably to the money printer. If you have cold stored Bitcoin, you have zero stress about your Bitcoin disappearing or your balance being bailed in by an insolvent entity. And if you believe the Fed will try to save the system, then the only way that can happen is via further destruction of the United States dollars. So you have to ask yourself what you value more. Are you trying to be well positioned for the long term or do you prefer to avoid volatility over the next six to 12 months at the expense of getting crushed long term? I think I like thinking long term. So holding Bitcoin makes sense to me. If you're holding Bitcoin too, your most important goal should be remain solvent, keep enough cash to cover expenses. If you lose your job for a while, job losses happen to make uh, at losses at times like these and you don't want to sell at the lows. Second, keep your Satoshis in cold storage. And then he goes ahead and talks about his own portfolio and so on and so forth. So I don't want to continue reading because this is why we're doing this interview. Everyone who wants to read this thread, go ahead. I'm going to keep the link in the description. And uh, we want to uh, have Stack talk 
himself about all his um, views on the current macro environment. Um, Stack, why don't we start with a little bit about yourself, as much as you want to tell everyone, who are you, uh, what's your background, how did you get into Bitcoin, and how did all of this start for you personally? Yeah, uh, okay, so name is Stack Hodler. Uh, let's say in a past life, I'm, I'm keeping it anonymous, so I'll just say in a past life, uh, founded a couple of technology companies, uh, but now I am a humble Swiss farmer, uh, stacking sats squeezing udders, and uh, just really trying to understand what the heck is going on in the macro situation. Um, I got into Bitcoin in 2017. I had no clue at all what I owned. Um, so I ended up selling the top because I saw everybody just like losing their mind. Uh, luckily, got out with some, some profit and was like, oh, that was cool. I guess it's just gonna like die now. Uh, and then I kind of just, I kept my eye on it and saw that it didn't die. And I'm sure this is a story of a lot of people. Uh, and then I just kind of started to ask like, okay, well, if it's not dead, and what, what the heck is this thing? And around that time, I also, I saw a post by Ray Dalio on LinkedIn, and he was describing this, this big debt cycle, uh, which I had heard nothing about. And, and honestly, I didn't, I didn't know a ton about the macro economy. I was, I was kind of into investing at the time um, and, and business, but I wasn't, I wasn't paying much attention to the macro situation. But so reading this Ray Dalio post and, and kind of seeing that we were coming to the end of this giant you know, 75 to 100 year cycle um, and that it was going to have massive implications. Uh, and then, you know, one of the interesting things is he points out is like nobody, nobody alive who's investing right now has lived through this moment. Um, and so that kind of that kind of piqued my ears and my interest, and I, I started digging into it more. Um, and then shortly after that, you know, the, the Bitcoin standard came out, and that was those two. It was kind of a one-two punch, right? Like seeing Ray Dalio talking about the end of the big death cycle, and then reading the Bitcoin standard. It kind of fit together perfectly at the perfect time, um, and I, I, I kind of went, I went pretty deep into Bitcoin. So uh, I would say this around like 2019, and then uh, March of 2020 comes, the crash came. By that time, my conviction is at like all time highs, um, and I just, I just kind of like doubled down. And ever since then, it's just been a nonstop dive into what the heck is going on in the world, right? As we all kind of watch the world accelerate into just more and more chaos, these insane, you know, headlines every day. Um, and, and really just kind of unprecedented movements in, in the macro world. It's just been fun to dig in and, and just ask, you know, why is this happening? And so in that thread you just read, it kind of sums up a lot of the big moving pieces right now. And, and frankly, it's kind of hard to keep them all in your head at the same time uh, and to get the whole picture and see how they're all interlocked. But they definitely are. And I think a lot of the current events of today are influenced by these movements. And because so few people understand you know, what's going on in macro, they kind of just, they'll read a headline and they'll, and they'll be shocked and they'll say, oh my God. But if you add this context, it kind of, the, the bigger picture becomes clear and you see these parties that are kind of all jockeying for position uh, internationally. And I, I think we'll get into that, but it's just really, a, it's an interesting time right now. So I'm just doing my best to piece it together. I've been posting a bunch of stuff on Twitter, um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much who I am and, and what I'm doing. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, You've been really, uh, in my opinion, a rock star with your recent tweets. You've, you're putting things together in a very concise and uh, easy to understand way for a lot of plebs. And um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you really do. You really, really do. And um, thank you. Yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit about your your current views on on how things are going. What are your thoughts on the current currency war situation, and why do you think is the Federal Reserve hiking so much uh, their interest rates, and and how long can this continue? Yeah, uh, great question. So number one, the currency war. I think uh, just understanding. I actually, I, what I want to do is I want to start with. I just posted up this thread on Twitter today. Um, but I actually just read a speech from Putin that he made like five days ago. I saw that. Yeah. His, I saw that. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I'm no fan of Putin, but, you know, I, I did read through the speech because you want to see what all these various parties are thinking. What are their, what's their logic? Does it, does it hold up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I read through it and actually I was pretty surprised because a lot of it lines up with the analysis that a lot of Bitcoiners have. Um, and he's kind of calling out you know, the West on this current fiat monetary system. And he's, and he's stating things very plainly. So I just wanted to start with two quotes because I think it explains uh, at least his perspective and, and not just his perspective, but I think a lot of global players' uh, perspective and what they think about the current, you know, US dominated fiat monetary system. 
So I'll just read a couple of quotes here. Uh, mm -hmm. He says, so under the cloud of inflation, many developing nations are asking a good question. Why exchange goods for dollars and euros that are losing value right before our eyes? He then goes on to say, global currency reserves are at $7.1 trillion and 2.5 trillion euros. These reserves are devalued at an annual rate of about 8%. Moreover, they can be confiscated or stolen anytime if the United States dislikes something in the policy of the states involved. So these, these two quotes, they actually do a really good job of summing up this entire uh, this entire currency war, as we put it. And that's um, is just for context for everyone. This is not a Bitcoiner. This is Putin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, he's not a bit, as far as we know, he's not a Bitcoiner. Yeah. And I don't think he is. And I think, uh, you know, I, when I put this thread up, I didn't want to make it seem like, oh, I'm like simping for Putin or anything like that. And frankly, I don't think somebody like him who's so concerned with power, I don't think he's eager to give his power away to, you know, an, an unchangeable uh, monetary system like Bitcoin. You know, I think all of these rulers around the world would prefer to have control over their own currency. Um, now we'll get to that in the future, but I, I think ultimately it may still end up there despite their best wishes, uh, just because of the game theory. But, but just taking a step back here, I think the most important thing to understand is there's currently $13 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. So this is money that's held by various countries around the world, uh, Japan, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, Hong Kong, these are all some of the nations with the most foreign exchange reserves. And so this isn't, to just kind of explain what this is, it's not money that's really held in the bank. These are actually just bonds, right? So this is sovereign debt. Um, so out of that 13 trillion, about, I think it's like 56% of it is US dollar debt. Um, there's some, I think it's 20% Euro debt, maybe 6% yen, 5% pound sterling. So the various currencies, but most of them, uh, if not all of them, are being held as uh, it's sovereign debt from nations that are more or less bankrupt, right? It's sovereign debt from nations that have just been racking up debt for decades, and they've reached the point where their debt to GDP is so out of control that there's no way that they're going to be able to pay off this debt. Um, and the only way that they're going to be able to honor their obligations, so to, to actually return the value of these bonds, is going to be by debasing their currencies. So that's the, the dollar, like I said, the dollar, the euro, the yen. Sterling, they're all going to have to be debased. And if you know Stack Hodler in the field squeezing udders can tell you this, then you better believe that Putin and all these other rulers around the, around the world, they see this too. And so they have $13 trillion worth of quote unquote value. And they're like, this is gonna evaporate here soon. And we're reaching this point where, you know, that's 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 getting closer and closer. And so I think the, the biggest thing that we should all be paying attention to is it's definitely not the price of Bitcoin in the short term, because I, I know that can be frustrating, but uh, you know, Bitcoin goes up and down, it's gonna do what it's gonna do, but ultimately if it's gonna get to a million dollars a coin, which I think it's going to, it's gonna be because of these larger movements. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, like I said, $13 trillion foreign exchange reserves, where is that gonna go? If it's not gonna be held in these bonds long-term because people know that, you know, they're just gonna end up with some, some piece of paper that's worthless at the end, then the question we need to ask is like, where is it going to go? So then you have to look at the alternative. So I think that that is, that is what the currency war is. Um, and I think, you know, it leads you down the road to uh, looking at what the alternatives are. And uh, I'll, I'll just stop there. And are there yeah. any questions so far on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no, great explanation. Um, well, I mean, when, when people hear this uh, stack, they, they wonder, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but how is it possible that, yet the United States government or the United States central bank is right now doing the quite opposite and other central banks are, follow, are, are actually following suit. Like the ECB is now following suit as well with uh, not lowering, but rather uh, increasing interest rates. How, how would yeah. you respond to that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting to watch. Um, well, okay, so just first of all, just taking the Fed, you know, they have a dual mandate. So they have two things they need to do. They need to keep inflation around 2% that's their stated goal. And they need to keep employment uh, relatively high, maximum employment. And so if they're hitting, I think the last CPI print was like 8.6%. They really don't, if, if they want to maintain any credibility at all, they need to be using every tool in their box to try to get that inflation down towards 2%. 
Now, we may all just know that that's kind of a joke and there's no freaking way they're going to do it. In fact, fun fact here, I learned this from, uh, I think it's Paul, was it Paul Tudor Jones? No, Stanley Druckenmiller you know, was saying this the other day. He basically, he said that once CPI in the U.S. has gone past 5%, there has never been a time in history when the U.S. has been able to lower that CPI without raising the Fed funds rate above the CPI number. So translated, that means that right now the Fed would have to get Fed funds rate above 8.6% to have a chance to lower that inflation. That is not going to happen. If that happens, everything is going to completely explode, not just in the U.S., but in Japan, in Europe. It's all, it's all just going to completely disappear, go poof. So that can't happen. Uh, but they still need to act like they're trying to do something. And so the, and there is a little bit of a method to the madness. The idea is that, you know, if they raise interest rates and they raise them rapidly, they're going to absolutely crush people's portfolios. And uh, I know I'm not alone. I'm sure everybody listening to this has experienced some pain in their portfolio recently. And that's, I mean, that's, that is the clear goal of the Fed. They want to make us feel uh, uh, less wealthy so that we spend less. And the idea is that that reduces demand um, and then it can help prices come down. And it may work. Um, it's, it's definitely possible. I, I guess we'll find out. None of us have really lived through this, so it's going to be interesting to see how it works. I mean, at the base, though, there is a supply issue. So a lot of these high prices are, are because of supply, and there's no manipulation of rates that's going to you know, increase the supply. And in fact, it's going to make it harder for businesses to take out loans to actually increase you know, production. So um, yeah, there's all that. And if you talk about the ECB and, and the Bank of Japan, I mean, that is a that is a tragic situation for both of them. And it's, it's, it would be laughable if it didn't have such serious consequences. But I mean, just starting from the least bad going to the worst. But with the ECB, I mean, they are, they are very trapped. They've had rates negative for years. Uh, and now they are trying to keep up with the Fed. Uh, one of the things to understand is like if, if one central bank is raising, that makes their currency stronger and it attracts capital and it attracts it away from, from other places. So if the US and the Fed are raising rates then you know you're going to see you're going to see money fleeing Europe and heading into the U.S. And so that kind of forces you know the ECB to take these steps to try to keep pace. But it's a joke. They're they're not going to be able to keep pace. Um, they barely. They, I don't even think they've gotten back to zero percent yet. They like they signaled. They're like, oh, we're going to head back to like zero or, or slightly above. And then six days later, they're like, uh, folks, emergency meeting. Uh, things are not looking good in the bond market. So we're going to have to. Uh, they got together and they're like, well, all right, we don't want to completely walk that back. So they came out and they said something like. Uh, do you, remember what, do you remember what they called it? They said it was some like special policy tool they came up with. They invented some name that, you know, it's essentially it's going to be more quantitative easing in a different name. But so they're trying to keep things together in the EU. And then the Bank of Japan is just a complete basket case. I mean, they have, they've been doing, this is, I learned this recently and I was just like, this is a joke, but they've been doing yield curve control uh, since 2016 which is just outrageous, right? Like they've been at, this is yield curve control, at least I always thought of it as like, okay, this is like the end game for the Fed. Eventually the Fed is going to have to, you know, buy all these can you bonds maybe, to keep it. Stack, can, can you maybe uh, explain what yield curve control means for, yes. for, for people who yes. don't understand what, what, what you're talking about? What, what does that mean? Yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to explain it in simple yeah. terms. So basically you have a whole bunch of debt in Japan. Their debt to GDP is actually 250% which is far and away the worst out of any nation. Um, so you have tons and tons of debt and you wanna prevent yields from rising because if yields rise, it means the debt gets way more expensive to service. So every company or individual um, that needs to service their debt, you know, roll it over. Uh, if they have to roll it over with higher interest rates, there's so much debt that it's just gonna get defaulted on. And so the entire Japanese economy is just gonna, it's gonna completely implode. And then also when yields are rising, it means the value of the bonds is falling. And so all of this debt, it's held by very conservative Japanese people. You can think of like pension funds, uh, insurance funds, et cetera. And so if, if they let yields rise, then a lot of these quote unquote assets on the balance sheets of these entities, they're gonna go down significantly, right? And so they're gonna be insolvent too. So bottom line is like, okay, we can't let yields rise, um, which is another way of saying we can't let people sell these bonds. Right, or we, there has to be a buyer for these bonds. Um, and so what they do is they step in and they become the buyer of the last resort. So if a whole bunch of people want to sell Japanese government debt, they make sure that they set a price floor and they say, all right, we're going to buy everything at this rate and that's going to keep yields at you know, 0.25%, which is their target. And at 0.25%, the theory is like, okay, if we can keep servicing this debt, we're not all going to go insolvent at the same time and you know, everything's hunky-dory. 
And they had, they were actually able to do it since 2016 because they've had so many deflationary pressures, you know, aging population, et cetera, et cetera, that they've actually gotten away with it and, you know, technological trends, things like that. But now you have, not only do you have a supply crunch, so everything that people need to buy is becoming more scarce, uh, that's driving some inflation there all of a sudden. But then you also have the Fed raising rates. And so that's, that's pulling more money out of Japan. As, so that leads to more people selling bonds, and which means that Bank of Japan needs to suddenly buy massive amounts of Japanese government debt. And the only way they can do that is by printing Japanese yen from the sky. And so what they're doing is they're just debasing the yen to buy their junk debt uh, and hoping that they can keep this game going. So, so yeah, that, because, yeah, because logically speaking, it would make, uh, uh, I mean, if, if, if I tell any law, any, person who doesn't understand all of this that the yields are going up that actually mm -hmm. it would be in a normal real uh, reality would be something positive right because you can earn more if you lend but it, that's only if you have a lot of savers right if you have a strong right. currency it makes yes. a, it makes sense if if rates go up but if you have everyone in 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 in, in society being highly indebted you you cannot let interest rates go up because if you do, yeah. it's going to crush everyone and it's going to destroy the entire economy. So what you end up doing is you're going to artificially start um, printing currency out of thin air uh, to keep the interest rates low, which comes at the cost of making the currency itself worthless. Exactly. Yep. That's well said. And I think if you look at so I think these, the debt to GDP level is, is kind of the thing to look at around the world. And, you know, Japan by far the worst, like I said, 250%. Interestingly, if you look at, for example, Russia, uh, they have, I think it's 15% debt to GDP. So there are countries that have much lower debt to GDP and they actually have room to raise rates. Switzerland's another one. Switzerland, I think it's 40% debt to GDP. And we just saw them raise rates at the central bank. Uh, no problem. You know, I mean, it, it does make it harder to, you know, take out a mortgage uh, for an expensive home. Um, but it's not going to blow up the entire system. If you don't have too much debt. And in the past, I mean, the U.S. was able to do this too. When we had inflation ripping in the 70s, uh, the U.S. was able to raise rates significantly. I think they got up to almost 20%. Um, so everybody talks about, you know, oh, it's going to be a repeat of the 70s. It's like, well, no, it's not. Because back then it was debt to GDP of something like 35, 38. And now we're at, I think the U.S. is at what, like 120 or 130, somewhere in between there. Uh, so it's a completely different ballgame. I, I think the, the policy tools are limited. And so this, this whole, you know, Fed's raising rates, it, it kind of feels like a, it feels like a fake out. And I honestly, Matt, I've been, I've been surprised to see how many people just buy it. You know, like they believe the Fed, everything the Fed says they believe. And they're like, you know, inflation is transitory. People believe it. Uh, you know, we're going to raise rates and get inflation down. People believe it. But I think we reached the point where things start to kind of break. Um, and there's, there's various things that could break and currently are breaking. Uh, and at that point, it's that's when it gets real, and we and we see, you know, how serious the Fed yeah. is. Let's let's actually do a transition to my next question, which is something you just mentioned: uh, yeah. things breaking. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, people who are in the space, um, in the investment space, talk about a reversal of uh, the decisions of the Federal Reserve once things start start to break. Um, mm -hmm. we, we are already, in my opinion, seeing a lot of things break, but what is, in your opinion, the thing that needs to break for them to reverse course and start to ease again? And is there, in your opinion, some sort of scenario where we could have a deflationary uh, catastrophe a catastrophe where even if they would reverse course it would be too late because uh, the entire system would just collapse or uh, just implode in in itself because of so much debt god you know what sometimes i look at the i look at the charts on trading view and i and i have that feeling i'm like man i really hope they have one more can kick left in them you know because i don't think we're ready for this whole thing to collapse I, I, nobody wants that not bitcoin or nobody because i think that that is, it's hard to imagine the consequences of that. And, and frankly, I mean, they have, they are playing with fire. Um, a lot of this comes down to confidence in these central banks. Um, and, and sometimes I question how much control they actually have. Uh, but that's, yeah, so that's your second part of the question. But I think 
yeah, what's what's gonna break? I mean, the thing, not to not to beat a dead horse, but the thing I keep watching because I think it's just the weakest point is this Bank of Japan and yen situation. And for me, I mean, it's it's the, the yen is the third largest currency in the world, um, and it's a ma- and Japan's a massive uh, economy. But I think the the biggest thing there from the Fed's perspective is Japan is actually the largest holder, uh, largest foreign holder of U.S. debt. They hold, I think it's like $1.6 trillion worth of, of debt. And one thing that countries do to defend their currency when it's devaluing is sell assets, right? Like, so, so they can, the Japanese, the Bank of Japan could in theory, and actually they have been doing this in, in smaller amounts, but they could, they could sell a significant, significant portion of their US treasuries uh, to defend the yen. And they might be pushing them to that point. Right now they're saying, you know, we're gonna keep doing this yield curve control. We're gonna buy unlimited. Japanese government bonds. But the further the Fed goes, the further they tighten and, and push this, the more bonds the Bank of Japan is going to have to buy and the weaker the yen is going to get. And I think you reach a point where that potentially becomes the thing that breaks because Japan gets forced to start selling U.S. treasuries. And do the they Fed hold a lot want... of do, do they hold a lot of U.S. treasuries? Yeah, they hold one point, I believe it's one point six trillion dollars worth of U.S. treasuries. So oh, they're wow. the largest holder of foreign treasuries and so So for them it's not it's not china anymore because uh, as far as i i I thought it's it's china first china is the second largest they have right right around a trillion oh wow okay yeah and so japan is even an even larger holder um and unfortunately that means that if they start defending their currency by selling treasuries they're going to be doing that at the same time the fed is starting their quantitative tightening so the Fed is saying, okay, not only are we raising interest rates, we're gonna we're gonna start rolling off some of these assets off our balance sheet, meaning we're gonna stop buying so many of these bonds. In fact, we're gonna stop buying and we're gonna start selling some of these bonds as well. And so that just means that there's one less giant buyer in the market. And if you remove what has been the largest buyer, uh, foreign at least, of U.S. Treasuries, and then they start to sell their Treasuries, then you get in a situation where now U.S. yields are also shooting up, which they already have been, but now they start really shooting up. Um, because again, if you think about it, there's a huge new supply of U.S. treasuries on the market and there's not enough buyers. And so the price of the bond has to go down. And when the price of the bond goes down, the yield goes up. And when the yield goes up, things become more expensive to service, like debt becomes more expensive to service. So all of these companies that have in the U.S. that have a ton of debt, um, the U.S. itself, you know, with 120% GDP, debt to GDP, that's going to be a lot harder to service, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the Fed can't let yields rise either. But if they push Japan to the breaking point and Japan is forced to sell some of these treasuries, then the U.S. is going to have, you know, yield surging as well. And so does that push them to the point where they say, OK, either we need to reverse course to, to stop this trend um, and, help, and help the Bank of Japan. That's one option, just reverse course then. Another option would be, uh, and this one, I'm not actually sure this is reasonable, but as one thing I thought of is like, well, technically they could start buying, the Fed could start buying Japanese government bonds uh, to help the Bank of Japan out. So to prevent Japan from dumping a bunch of US treasuries, maybe the Fed says, okay, you know what, we're just going to help, help you buy these bonds that nobody wants. Uh, that'll support the yen. It'll hurt the US dollar a little bit, but at least you're not going to be dumping US treasuries onto the market. So that's another that's another way it could it could play out, um, but that's yeah I mean that's that's really what I'm watching. Uh, there's one other there's one other kind of crazy theory I, I would I would put out there. I'm not convinced of this, but it's one to keep an eye on, and I, I think it's it's relatively falsifiable, so I don't mind putting it out. But there's a there's an opinion that some people have that the Fed is actually trying to uh, quote unquote break these other central banks, so the ECB, uh, the Bank of Japan. And the idea behind it, and even even you know, what is it, the People's Bank of China, uh, whatever it's called. Uh, so the the idea is that they see the writing on the wall um, for the U.S. dollar. They see people wanting to move away from the U.S. dollar, and to them, the best play is why don't we just destroy all the competition? We're going to take a ton of pain here at home, um, but at least the U.S. dollar can be one of the last currencies standing. We know the Bank of Japan is going to fail. The ECB is going to fail. Um, we're going to remove their power. And then, you know, at the last moment, we'll try to salvage our own power. Uh, that is a theory. I don't, I don't really buy into it necessarily because I think that, I think that the Fed is just in bigger trouble than most people yeah, think. Yeah. I mean, but, that, that, that would, that would be realistic if, if the U S didn't have as much 
uh, national problems, right? But they, they have mm -hmm. so much problems themselves that if they would do that, I mean, because they also depend on other countries buying their debt right so just just like right. you just explained if if the bank of japan would start selling their their treasuries they would be in trouble too right so so it's like a it's like a vicious cycle of um a, a, a circle of, of 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 having no alternative than just debasing at the end of the game at the end of the day so um uh, yeah, I mean, they could do that. The, the theory sounds actually logical, but if, if they didn't have as much debt, maybe, but they have themselves so much debt that I, I think they, they would just shoot themselves in the foot. But it's an interesting theory, though. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I, don't necessarily, I don't necessarily buy into it. I, I do think, though, sadly, it's like, unfortunately, it's not going to end in a good place for, for any of these countries. I mean, looking at this debt, uh, I, I do think it's inevitably going to be monetized and there's going to be massive devaluation of U.S. dollar, uh, which is going to lead to, you know, a huge change in the U.S. just in terms of what people are used to. And if you consider the advantage that the U.S. dollar system has brought to the United States, uh, it's, it's massive and, mo and most people don't realize it. But if you can just print money and buy real assets with it, like you can you can buy oil just by printing money. That's a huge advantage. So if that, if that disappears and, and real prices Kind of come back into reality. I think that that's going to be a very difficult transition for uh, for these Western nations, and not just the U.S., but a lot of the West that's been living off of this printed printed currency. I think that's what Putin is signaling. He's like, "Hey, this is done. We're done accepting your your paper. We're done with all of this. You're going to have to give us real something valuable, right? If you want something valuable from us, you're going to have to give us something valuable in return. And uh, you can't just debase your currency that you give us, right? That's just not fair. And I can definitely see that point. Yeah. Definitely, I, I I agree with you. Um, yeah, I mean, this is not a political discussion, but because we no longer have a free market, uh, investors uh, are forced to uh, have a political discussion of uh, what politicians will decide. Unfortunately, so yeah. uh, for anyone listening, don't 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 think Stack or me or anyone is on either side of of the of of this. Uh, debate of which country is going to do what but uh, it's it's unfortunately affecting all of us and uh, this is this is supposed to be a very healthy discussion of how things can play out and how we can protect ourselves from this madness um, right. so that leads me to the next question stack so how do you I mean this sounds also so interrelated and codependent among these countries and the game theory is is so ridiculously complex that it leads to the huge question of how things or what's the catalyst case for the end game of all this like and, and why do you think is is bitcoin or even why do you think bitcoin plays any role in in, in all of this yeah so so first of all i think I, I, what I predict, and it's just a prediction that, that definitely could be wrong. You know, I don't, don't know more than anybody else, but I th think the Fed is going to end up having to pivot um, potentially this fall. So probably before they're saying they're going to, I think they're saying they're going to keep tightening into, you know, well into next year, but I think they're going to be forced to change course earlier than that. And I think they're going to have to change course when we're still looking at very high CPI levels, you know, well above 2%. Um, and I think at that moment, people are going to have to start asking some serious questions, uh, you know, questions that a lot of these sovereigns are already asking. But the, the question is, you know, where can I where can I store my my wealth? Where can I protect my wealth? Um, and it's a question that, you know, a lot of us have been asking for a while. And so we've done the we've done the analysis. We've looked at all the various asset classes, et cetera. Um, but I think once once this reality sets in of like, hey, these central banks don't actually have this under control. And this is all heading to one place, and that's the debasement of all these currencies. I think then the the catalyst is just the question that people are going to have to ask. Um, and when I say people, I mean obviously individuals. But I think you know there's there's sovereign wealth funds, for example, that have massive, massive amounts of money. So you can take, I mean, just take Norway, you know, for to take a European example. But you have Norway. I believe their sovereign wealth fund is something like 1.5 trillion dollars, and Okay, they've been investing in, they actually don't, I, I don't think they hold, you know, that many bonds. What they've been doing is they've been buying 
a ton of equities. They allegedly own 1.5% of all publicly listed shares in the world, which is pretty crazy. Um, and you can see the logic in that. They want to they own businesses that are you know, producing real value in the world and um, et cetera, et cetera. But then when I think of this world we're going into, I think that, so you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to ask the question of like, okay, equities work really well for the past you know, 10, 20 years with very low interest rates, globalization, et cetera. But what's the world we're moving into? And what's the asset best suited for that? And if you analyze equities, you can kind of think of, okay, we have, we have this trend of deglobalization. So you have countries that are moving supply chains back on shore. Um, you have an increase in, we call it competitive attitudes amongst countries. Um, so you have all these headwinds now for equities that are gonna make them, it's gonna make, it's gonna make it harder for businesses to turn a profit. Right or even sell products. You know, if, let's say supply chains are breaking down. You have to, you have to supply your product uh, production. That's going to be that's going to be maybe harder. So that's that's not a great trend to have either. And then if you do have rising interest rates, then all of this debt is going to be a lot more expensive to service for these businesses. So our equity is a great place um, potentially. Like they they could potentially go up, but I, but I think there's one other question that all these uh, countries and sovereign wealth funds etc. are going to have to ask, and that's you know, what can I truly own? Um, because now, I mean, and this is what, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking about, but now these countries see like, hey, if I get on the wrong side of, let's say the United States or, or Western countries, they can just freeze my assets, right? And that's, yeah, it's foreign exchange reserves, but that could be equities too, you know, or, or any real estate that is in their jurisdiction, they can just be frozen. Um, and so heading into a more adversarial world, what do I want to own? Um, now, the obvious answer might be gold. It might be that, hey, we all have, you know, we already have some gold. Uh, it's already like in our central banks. It's a $10 trillion market. So it's a lot more liquid than something like Bitcoin. Um, so they may, they may move to something like that, uh, at least in the short term. And I, I actually wouldn't be surprised if, if that's maybe the first step that these, these countries take. Uh, but I think very quickly, and, and Bitcoiners know this, but I think very quickly, then you realize, you know, the shortfalls of gold. It's like, are we going to start sending airplanes full of gold for every, you know, every time we want to settle a transaction between countries? Um, you know, there was Germany that pulled back, I think, 600 tons of gold uh, a few years ago. And when they repatriated it, they had to melt it all down. They had to verify that it was actually gold and they had to recast it as bars. Can you imagine every time you want to do a transaction, you have to you have to do that? That's it's just kind of insane. And then if you want to turn around and, and buy goods from somebody else, you have to send your gold to them. It's just it's a big mess. And if you if you think about Bitcoin, it's just such a clear you know uh, innovation. That's it's just it's better than gold. I mean that's that's just kind of the honest truth. And so it's as a Bitcoiner, you kind of wait for people to to understand it and come to that realization, um, and then you know. The, the game theory of, okay, all it takes is one, one, let's say Saudi Arabia realizes this and they say, you know, we're not really interested in going back to gold. Uh, we're just going to stake our claim on the Bitcoin blockchain now. Um, and we're going to demand payment in Bitcoin. You know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to make Bitcoin look so legitimate by demanding payment in it. Um, and we're going to hold our, instead of holding foreign exchange reserves and all these sovereign debt bonds, we're going to start holding Bitcoin because it's the most scarce, the asset that, asset that has performed the best. Um, and we understand why, and it can't be taken from us. So I think that that is something that, that could happen. I think Bitcoin could uh, fall into that. Frankly, my timeline on that is, uh, it's up in the air. I have no clue how fast that could happen. It's the type of thing though, where like, if it did happen, let's say Saudi Arabia did announce that, this thing would just absolutely rocket you know, overnight. Because all of a sudden, every single entity needs to claim a space on the Bitcoin blockchain. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of hodlers that are just riding this, you know, for a long, long time because they believe in the asset. Um, so if, if you do want to think about pricing, you could, you, could, you could think of that and say like, as soon as, as soon as this does get adopted in that way, price is going to absolutely rock it. It's, it's, it's going to take only one main, major country to do that, right? It's, it's right. just going to be like fire. Yeah. And so if they do move to gold, I, I, I think... <laughs> I think honestly, that's we're just one half step away from Bitcoin at that point, right? Because it all it takes is one person to get annoyed and say, "All right, this is ridiculous. Why are we melting this down every time when there's something that's even more scarce that we can send digitally that can be, you know, verified, 
you know, confirms transactions every 10 minutes. I mean, it's, it's a completely, it's a much better asset uh, for this modern environment we're in. Um, and it's a complete bearer asset, right? So I think it's just, if, if that does happen, if the gold thing happens, I, I think we're then, you know, half step away and it's basically strap yourself in at that point, make sure you have as many stats as, as, as you can get because uh, this thing could just take off overnight. You know, Stack, I know that people are listening to this and, you know, most people have exposure to Bitcoin because of, you know, the short term price that they thought it would reach. Right. Yeah. So what do you respond to a person who says, uh, yeah, you know, you, you sound kind of logical and it makes all sense what you say, but. Bitcoin is down over 70% uh, in the past year or so. Um, what makes you think that this is going to change and Bitcoin would decouple from, let's say, equities or risk assets? Because right now, as we speak, I mean, we understand this, but the market obviously does not understand this yet because Bitcoin is not treated as a risk off, but rather a risk on asset. Um, how would you respond to that? And what do you think needs to happen for investors to get to this understanding? Because, you know, to be honest, I, I, I'm quite fascinated how dumb investors can be, even very wealthy investors who don't put the time to understand this. And there is so much misunderstanding on Bitcoin. It's in my opinion, it's the most misunderstood asset right now globally. Um, so how would you respond to that? And what do you think must happen for Bitcoin to decouple? Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think it is extremely misunderstood. And I think the price is the perfect proof point for that. Um, and not just the fact that it's down right now when equities are down, but the whole time it was, it was moving along uh, with you know, when equities are up, Bitcoin's up. Uh, but then the other thing is you can look at when Bitcoin's up and shit coins are up, right? If all of these other coins that, are, that we know just by analyzing them are, are mostly garbage, uh, if they're moving at the same rate, that just all that tells me is that the big money that's investing in this has no clue what Bitcoin is, right? Because if they're grouping it in with Doge or, or whatever other coin you want to think of, then they just have no clue what Bitcoin is and how it's different. Otherwise, they wouldn't, they wouldn't just be... I think what they're doing is they're spreading their, their, their investment across a broad portfolio. I, I feel myself getting sick as I'm saying this. They're like spreading it across a broad portfolio of coins, thinking that this is like the prudent thing to do. Because, because they have this mindset, because they have this yes. mindset from traditional finance, right? B diversification. Exactly. But they, they, exactly. they, they diversify actually, not they, diversify. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So they have this like fiat investing mindset where, yeah, you want to own like a little bit of everything and you don't have to think about what you actually own, right? That's the whole idea behind index investing. You don't have to know about the underlying companies. You just have to buy the index and number goes up and you can chill and not think. And I think that that is what we've seen in the prices, right? That's why we've seen shit coins keep pace, even though it makes no freaking sense. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's disappointing, but it's also exciting because it means that the true value prop is not at all priced in. Besides, you know, the hodlers and, and the people who do truly understand this, that are stacking every day. I mean, that's that's mostly retail small accounts. I'd say. I'd say there's probably a few large, uh, large investors that that do get this, like a Bill Miller type person. But the vast majority. I mean, the price action tells you that the vast majority do not understand the value prop, and they don't understand. I mean, just think about. Nobody thinks about the actual assets themselves these days. They just look at the price, which to me is just it drives me nuts. But I think it's it's a symptom of this, you know, fiat money printing where there's so much money, you just throw it at everything and, and it all goes up. So you don't have to think about the underlying asset. But if you just compare, you know, what, compare Bitcoin to an equity, it's entirely different. With an equity, you have what, you have a, you've got a, you have a board, you have an execution risk, you have a CEO who could end up in jail, you have companies that rely on supply chains. Yeah, it's, it's entirely different than, you know, a scarce, uh, open source asset that you can transact peer to peer. Like it's just, it's just a different thing. So the fact that it moves in line with equities, just again, it just tells me that the true value prop is not priced in, and that's that's a good thing for us. Um, so what you really have to do is pay attention to the overall picture, uh, understand where Bitcoin fits into this, and understand that there are huge things happening right now, right? And so price price is going to move around. It's going to be volatile, and 
it's probably going to be a scary ride, but how does this fit into the world that we're heading into? And I think, you know, when I, when I look at where I think we're headed and that's, you know, the debasement of currency, I really just want to own an asset that uh, is finite, that I can self custody and know that I have zero counterparty risk um, and that I understand. And so I'm, I'm happy to hold through these, you know, these crazy price movements while uh, all of this stuff plays out. And I, and I think when this, you ask, you know, when does this decouple? Um, I think it just happens when more people start asking urgent questions, uh, which is what we're starting to see, you know, around the world. It's just people are wondering now, okay, there's 13 trillion in FX reserves that needs to move somewhere. And we want something that can't be debased. And we want something that can't be confiscated. And Bitcoin is one of the only things that fits into that. So I think it's just a natural progression. I think more people need to ask the question and just get away from this fiat mindset of like, all right, I'm just going to spray money at everything. And, you know, some of it's going to go up and I'll be good. Yeah, I mean, the, the mindset of the fiat uh, world is kind of, you know, they want to reduce risk by diversifying into multiple assets. Uh, and, and, and it's hard to wrap your head around something like Bitcoin because Bitcoin actually solves that mindset. Because like, if you, if you really think this through why they do it, it's because they don't want to trust one company, right? They don't want to have their eggs in one basket. And that's why they want to diversify to not trust one, but multiple uh, let's say multiple companies, right? So if one breaks, the other one would would maybe survive, right? right. And right. actually, what Bitcoin does, and I was listening to a, a really good German podcaster who who was explaining this very very well. Um, I mean, if you look at Bitcoin's price action right now, you would say, "What what the heck are you even talking about, RK?" But if you really truly understand what Bitcoin is, Bitcoin actually solves that because you do not need to trust anyone, no one, mm -hmm. no individual, yep. no, no, nothing, no one. Whereas with anything outside of Bitcoin, in quote unquote crypto, you have all sorts of, um, uh, you know, co uh, controlling uh, bodies who uh, change and 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 dump and you know scam on 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 people um mm -hmm. so in my opinion you know bitcoin is the ultimate answer or it's actually bitcoin is saving right because you can you can ultimately hold this hold this asset and be 100% certain that no one can take it away from you and no one can um print it and uh, there is no CEO. So there is no need to diversify actually because there is no CEO. Um, I love, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I mean the, the reason why you want to own an equity is because you want to take some risk, right? And I think Bitcoin is going to bring this back, this mindset of, okay, we're not going to be all investors. Only people who want to take risk are going to be investors mm -hmm. and people who want to save will just hold Bitcoin. And uh, that's the ultimate risk of asset. But I guess that's going to take a while until, until the world wakes up to that. Yeah, but I, I mean, if you think about just what in the 90s, it was even you didn't have you didn't have to be an investor you know, back then. You could you could actually still put your money in a bank and earn a reasonable interest rate uh, and you could save that. That was a thing. Um, and it's only when interest rates get to zero percent that it forces everybody out on the risk curve. You don't have a choice. It's like if you want to preserve your purchasing power. You know, your currency is uh, getting debased at what, 2 to 3% minimum per year. So you need to start taking risks. You need to find something that's going to return more than that. And that leads people into equities. And that's why, you know, everybody was buying index funds because they're like, this is our only chance of preserving purchasing power. But that can change, like you say. I mean, that can, that can go into something that's as simple and clear as, a, as an open monetary system. Um, where you don't have to think about, okay, does this company, is this company going to survive, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a beautiful vision for the future. And I think a world where a doctor doesn't need to be a hedge fund manager is, is a place where I want to live. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, um, the world is just the way it is right now. That's, that's what we have to deal with at the moment, but uh, let's see how things go. So uh, that leads us, uh, Stack, to 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 the last uh, part of, of of this amazing interview. Um, when it comes to your personal portfolio, you've been very very public online 
on Twitter about your personal allocation. And uh, I think by now it's obvious why you would put 80% in, in Bitcoin, a uh, cold stored Bitcoin. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that as well, why cold stored and nothing else. Uh, but you also have a 15% allocation to Swiss francs, not dollars, not euros, but Swiss francs, and 5% of gold. Uh, maybe you can walk us through through your thinking and decisions why you had uh, why you have allocated your portfolio the way you have. Sure. Yeah. And Bitcoin. Yeah, like you said, it's it's obvious on the cold storage part. I think you know the whole point about Bitcoin is to have no counterparty risk. Uh, meaning if a bank fails, you don't have to worry because you still have your Bitcoin in cold storage, right? If you have your Bitcoin on Coinbase or something and Coinbase goes down and you lose your Bitcoin, then the entire point of having no, no counterparty risk goes out the window. So that's, I mean, that's number one. Yeah, cold store your Bitcoin for sure. Uh, why the cash? Um, so there's, there's two things. Number one, why cash? And then why Swiss francs? But so for cash, I think for me, the way, I, the way I view the world is like, we're either headed for massive inflation and currency debasement, or you know, central banks completely screw things up and we head to a depression um, and massive deflation. And so if there's massive, I, I don't think it's gonna go that way. My, my, clearly my 80% Bitcoin holdings points to the idea of them just debasing their way out of this, uh, out of this debt crisis. But, if they do screw things up and we end up in, you know, a depression, I, I don't rule that out. And I, I, you look back in history and you say, what, what would you have wanted to have in that situation? You would definitely want some cash, right? Because that's the thing that nobody would have and that everybody would need. Um, and all assets relative to cash uh, would lose value. Um, in other words, your cash would gain enormous purchasing power, um, and you would just, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to sell your assets at a fire sale. Um, so that's, I mean, honestly, that's useful at a time like now when, when literally everything is crashing, uh, you see all these assets plummeting. The only thing that's, that's all, that's all relative to cash, right? So if something's going down 20% a day, that's relative to cash. So the cash gained 20% that day relative to that asset. Um, and so in a deflationary moment, like we're in, I think cash is a really good thing to have. It helps you sleep at night. Um, and then, you know, if the fed signals a turnaround and, and things start to take off, then you can put some of that cash uh, into like a Bitcoin or, or something that you, you know, is going to go up then. So that's why I hold cash specifically. Uh, why Swiss francs? I live in Switzerland. So, you know, holding any other currency outside of uh, Swiss francs, is, it's kind of just a, to me, it's an unnecessary currency risk. Also, I trust the Swiss franc. Um, you know, like I said, 40% debt to GDP in Switzerland. Uh, it's, it's proven to be a strong currency over time. There's a lot of safe haven demand for the Swiss franc. Uh, which means that they have they have a lot of leeway in in uh, keeping the Swiss franc as strong as they want. Um, and I could go into further detail there, but that that kind of sums that up. And then uh, for gold, gold, I kind of honestly, I, I kind of bought gold reluctantly because I, you know, I fully believe in in Bitcoin and I see how it's a much better monetary asset. But at the same time, gold does check a lot of the same boxes, so I do understand the value prop of gold. If there's no counterparty risk. You can hold it, um, and it's it's a it's a bearer asset, right? And the, the only reason I really bought it uh, was in the event of some sort of black swan, like a quote unquote cyber pandemic that has been previewed by uh, some people. But um, yeah, I mean, in a situation where let's say the grid goes down uh, or I can't get on the internet, it would be nice to know that you know my no my number one goal with all this is like protect my family, protect our our uh, living standard as, as best as I can. And I think that holding something that's offline uh, and physical, I think is just a good step towards that end. So that's why I hope gold as well. It's like uh, for the event of the unknown of the unknown of the unknown, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's insurance. And honestly, one day I hope I'm able to use it as, you know, a paperweight um, and I'll have to think about it. But in the meantime, it's, it's good to have that little, uh, that little peace of mind knowing that there's, there's something there. By the way, with cash, I mean, you also want to keep some of that uh, physical as well. You know, you can store that in a, uh, like, you, if, if you want to use a, like a gold storage service, you could put some cash in there too, just in a safety box that way. Because because cash, if you just leave it in a bank, it does have some counterparty risk. And by the way, if you're going to store your gold, don't store your gold in a bank. Store it in, you know, an institution that's made for storing gold. Because if that bank, if you store it in a bank and the bank goes insolvent, 
they could technically claim your your big or your gold as collateral. So um, keep that in a specific institution for storing gold, uh, and that's the way to go. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, can you maybe? Uh, I, I mean, I, I have personally lived in Switzerland for over five years. I told you offline in our conversation. Yeah. Um, I, I have been, I mean, I, I lived before I moved to Switzerland. I lived in many places. I've, uh, I, I lived in Dubai before that. And uh, now I'm back in Germany. But I've, I've spent in, in multiple places. One thing that I think a lot of people do not really understand is... Um, why the Swiss have always been this, uh, like what makes them so, so different compared to all the other nations? Uh, because I, I find it, I mean, obviously if you live there, it makes sense to hold Swiss francs, but I think there is more than only just uh, the reason that you live there. Uh, I mean, is it because the central bank has been comparably more responsible compared to the other central banks? Because, you know, the, the way I I look at uh, fiat currencies is like, you know, I, I'm not really sure who made this um, uh, who made this expression, but it's like looking inside your closet and you have a bunch of dirty shirts and uh, one of them is less dirty than the others right? But they're all mm -hmm. dirty, right? Yeah. So th that's how I look at the fiat currencies. They, they all are going to eventually go to zero. But mm. it, it, for the short term, it's just, um, you know, maybe a good idea to have the least dirty shirt just in case uh, of a catastrophe in the short term so that you can actually weather the storm and huddle uh, on your Bitcoin or a little bit of your gold, right? So can you maybe, yeah. uh, do you know a little bit about the uh, national policies of the Swiss and why they are or they have been such a safe harbor for investors? Yeah, I think it comes down to uh, Switzerland just being a very stable place uh, as a long track record of uh, stability, great property rights uh, that are really respected here. Um, it's a direct democracy. Uh, and like I mentioned, I mean, low debt to GDP. The other thing, and I think this is a big reason why um, the Swiss franc is viewed as a safe haven, but it was one of the last fiat currencies to actually be linked to gold at all. So while all the other fiats went off the gold standard, Switzerland was one of the last ones to be on it. And even up until, yeah, I think it was the 90s, it was still uh, partially backed by gold. So they eventually changed, it was in the constitution, they eventually changed that. So they don't have to back it by gold anymore. But it's kind of a hangover from that, uh, where people still view the Swiss franc as a safe haven. And now, like I said, I think now it's just because it's a stable government and uh, it's a good jurisdiction to hold wealth. Also, like everybody knows, it's a it's a it's a neutral country. Um, so the idea is that if there is chaos in the world, uh, usually in Switzerland, the chaos doesn't doesn't cross the borders, and so your money can be safe there. Um, and I think that you know they've 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 tried to manage that and uh, keep that perception alive and. And the thing is, and I, I wrote a thread about this. So if you want to read more, you can, you can find it on my Twitter. But um, the funny thing is they, they've channeled a lot of that demand for the Swiss franc uh, into U.S. equities. So what they did was you had a bunch of, let's, let's say, a bunch of Americans come over and they say, hey, we want to buy Swiss francs. And the Swiss National Bank says, okay, let me print some off for you. Uh, and then they give those Swiss francs in exchange for the dollars. And so now the Swiss Swiss bank has a bunch of dollars that they just got for free, essentially. And they turn around and they invest that into U.S. equities. Um, and so that's kind of the game they are playing over the last you know, decade. And they've amassed you know, billions of dollars worth of U.S. equity holdings, uh, as well as you know, treasuries. They're one of the largest holders of foreign exchange reserves in the world. Um, and so now they, they, they have these are two these assets they can actually use to defend the value of their currency, because if the Swiss franc weakens, um, not only can they raise interest rates with such a low debt to GDP, but they can start selling uh, U.S. equities, for example, um, to strengthen the Swiss franc, or they can they can sell foreign exchange reserves to strengthen it. So Switzerland's in a strong position. I would say I feel pretty comfortable holding Swiss francs, um, and obviously even more comfortable given that I live in Switzerland. So do, do they that's, hold? That's my thing. Do, do you know if they hold also treasuries, foreign treasuries, or they do? Yeah, they, they do. do. They, they're one of the largest holders, in fact. Uh, which is surprising for such a small country compared to like China, but I, I can't remember. They're, they might even be top five um, 
which is which is very surprising. I think a lot of that just comes from that demand for the Swiss franc. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a tough place to be if you want to have a strong currency uh, in a fiat world. You need to be competitive with your goods and services at the same time, right? You want to be able to export right. still, so you have to somehow find a balance. And uh, I think the best decision that the Swiss could have made was to not join the EU and mm -hmm. uh, end up in this situation of of of. Uh, having to rely on someone like uh, Lagarde or ECB, so uh, I, I'm also a huge fan of 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 the Swiss. They they seem to be in such a chaotic world, one of the fewest places where you can have some sort of safety. Yeah. Yeah. yeah agreed on that. Stack. Um, I would like to thank you so so much for your uh, valuable time it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, you have a very very interesting and uh, valuable perspective on all of this i've already shared my screen quickly just a few minutes ago to show your twitter handle but maybe you can also have the last few words and uh, tell everyone where people can find you and follow you i know that you have also a, a blog where you post a, a amazing Uh, th uh, threats of information. Maybe you can tell everyone about that as well. Sure. Yeah. Just uh, at, at Stack Hodler on uh, Twitter. Um, follow me. I tweet stuff every now and then. Actually, I'm lying every day. Uh, you don't have to follow the, uh, you don't have to subscribe to the email newsletter, but if you want to, I send stuff out, you know, I don't know, once every two weeks or so. Um, and yeah, definitely just follow me and, and come engage and, and interact and I would say the last, last word would just be, you know, stay solvent and, uh, and stack sats and ignore the price moving in the short term as hard as it is and, and just try to focus on this bigger picture stuff because that's ultimately what's going to get Bitcoin to where we all think it's going. So thank you so much, RK. This was, uh, this was great. No, I want to thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. I hope to meet you at some point or uh, even yeah. do another interview at some point in the future. Thank you so, so much for coming on. Uh, thanks for everyone who is listening. Um, this was the 13th episode of, of Big Guides uh, episodes. Uh, you can find this episode later on on YouTube uh, and, of course, on all the podcast applications like... Uh, Apple Podcasts and also uh, and also uh, Spotify. Thank you so much, Stack. Uh, I wish you a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.